I'm grateful for the opportunity to present the annual threat assessment and would just want to acknowledge the many people who have contributed to this work, from the collector to the analyst to everyone in between. This assessment is a product of their effort and they have our gratitude. This year's report notes that during the coming year, the United States and its allies will face an international security environment dominated by two strategic challenges that intersect with each other and existing trends to intensify their national security implications. First, great powers, rising regional powers, and an evolving array of non-state actors are vying for influence and impact in the international system, including over the standards and rules that will shape the global order for decades to come. And second, challenges that transcend borders, including climate change, transnational criminal activity, health and human security, and economic needs made worse by energy and food insecurity, as well as Russia's invasion of Ukraine, are intensifying as the plan and it emerges from the COVID-19 pandemic. And further compounding this dynamic is the impact that rapidly emerging technologies are having on governance, economies, communities around the world. The intersection of these challenges underscore the importance of working together with partners and allies to address the threats we face and how critical it is to counter efforts to undermine the global norms, principles, and mechanisms that promote and underpin national, transnational cooperation, which is an implicit theme in this year's threat assessment. The report starts with the People's Republic of China, as it is increasingly challenging the United States economically, technologically, politically, militarily, and from an intelligence standpoint around the world. And I'll spend most of my time on China and Russia, which are among our top priorities, and focus on updating our views with the latest, rather than repeating what's in the annual threat assessment. We assess that the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, under President Xi Jinping, will continue efforts over the next year to achieve Xi's vision of making China the preeminent power in East Asia and a major power on the world stage. What is perhaps most concerning is that the CCP is increasingly convinced that it can only fulfill Xi's vision at the expense of U.S. power and influence, and through tools of coercion, using demonstrations of strength, as well as economic and political coercion, to compel governments to acquiesce to the CCP's preferences, including the land, sea, and air claims in the region and its assertions of sovereignty over Taiwan. And the relationship between the United States and China has consequently become more challenging. Xi's public reference to America's suppression of China in March of this year reflects his longstanding standing distrust of U.S. goals and his belief that the United States seeks to contain China. Xi's speech was the most public and direct criticism that we have seen from him to date and probably reflects growing pessimism in Beijing about China's relationship with the United States, as well as his growing worries about the trajectory of China's domestic economic development and indigenous technology innovation, which he now seeks to blame on the United States. And even as the rhetoric has become more heated, we continue to assess that Beijing wants to preserve stability and avoid triggering additional technology restrictions or sanctions from the United States and our partners as they seek to narrow the gap in their economic and technological competition with us. Perceiving the United States as a threat, the PRC seeks to undercut U.S. influence and is looking to portray the United States as the root of global problems. China seeks to divide us from our allies and partners, frame U.S. actions as provocations that provide a basis for planned PRC aggression, which they then claim are simply responses, such as China's expansion of its military presence surrounding Taiwan, which the PRC asserted was in response to President Tsai's recent transit through the United States, as well as her meetings with two speakers of the House over the past year. And China's leaders are focused on spurring domestic economic growth this year, but in the long run, spurring indigenous technology innovation is paramount. President Xi remains confident that Beijing can innovate its way to the technological frontier, regardless of U.S. and allied restrictions, and that doing so will give China the competitive advantage that is crucial to achieving his vision for China as a world power. Nonetheless, we are likely to see more dissonant messaging and actions coming out of Beijing, such as the recent charm offensive by, Pres by Premier Li Chang welcoming foreign direct investment at the China Development Forum, juxtaposed against Beijing's pressure on foreign firms and executives, including investigations of U.S. firms and a clampdown on previous non-sensitive data flows out of China. 
The IC assesses that China's long-term economic growth will continue to decelerate because China's era of rapid catch-up growth is ending, and structural issues such as debt, demographics, inequality, over-reliance on investment and inadequate domestic consumption remain. And although the CCP may find ways to overcome its structural challenges over the long term, in the short term it continues to take an increasingly aggressive approach to external affairs, often to bolster its domestic agenda. China's leaders are increasing their investment in a world-class military, expanding their country's nuclear arsenal and cyber threat capacity, pursuing counter space weapons capable of targeting U.S. and allied satellites, forcing foreign companies and coercing foreign countries to allow the transfer of technology and intellectual property in order to boost indigenous capabilities, continuing to increase global supply chain dependencies on China with the possibility of using such dependencies to threaten and cut off foreign countries during a crisis. And the CCP is also seeking to reshape global governance in line with Xi's preferences and governance standards that that support the monopoly of power within China and expanding influence operations, including through the export of digital repression technologies. And furthermore, we've observed the expanding strategic ties between China and Russia, as mentioned by the chairman, another critical priority for the IC, which has been strengthened by the conflict in Ukraine. We're now over a year into the war, which is reshaping not only Russia's global relationships and strategic standing, but also our own, strengthening our alliances and partnerships in ways that President Putin almost certainly did not anticipate often precipitating the very events he hoped to avoid, such as Finland's accession to NATO and Sweden's petition to join, while also increasing Xi's leverage over Putin. On the battlefield, the fighting is principally focused in the east around Bakhmut and Avdivika, and remains a brutally grinding war of attrition in which neither military has a definitive advantage with day-to-day -day fighting over hundreds of meters. Russian forces gained less territory in April than during any of the three previous months as they appear to transition from offensive to defensive operations along the front lines. Russian forces are facing significant shortfalls in munitions and are under significant personnel constraints, but continue to lay minefields and prepare new defensive positions in occupied Ukrainian territory. Both sides are focusing on preparations for a potential Ukrainian counteroffensive this spring or summer designed to push Russia out of illegally annexed territory. And the Ukrainian armed forces are still finalizing the specific priorities, timing, and scale of the offensive, and Western assistance will be crucial in preparing both plans and forces. With the support of the Congress, the United States is doing a great deal to bolster Ukraine's chances for success. But even if Ukraine's counteroffensive is not fully successful, the Russians are unlikely to be able to mount a significant offensive operation this year. In fact, if Russia does not initiate a mandatory mobilization and secure substantial third-party ammunition supplies beyond existing deliveries from Iran and others, it will be increasingly challenging for them to sustain even modest offensive operations. At the same time, of course, Ukraine remains heavily dependent on external military aid, and would likely be unable to counter Russia's natural relative manpower and resource advantages if most Western military aid ceased. Furthermore, while we continue to assess that Putin most likely calculates the time works in his favor and that prolonging the war may be his best remaining pathway to eventually securing Russia's strategic interests in Ukraine, we assess that Putin probably has scaled back his immediate ambitions to consolidate control of the occupied territory in eastern and southern Ukraine and ensuring that Ukraine will never become a NATO ally. Putin's willingness to consider a negotiated pause may be based on his assessment that a pause would provide a respite for Russian forces as they could try to use that time to regain strength before resuming offensive operations at some point in the future while buying time for what he hopes will be an erosion of Western support for Ukraine. Yet he may be willing to claim at least a temporary victory based on roughly the territory he is occupying. And the challenge is that even as Putin may be scaling back his near-term ambitions, the prospect for, China, for Russian concessions to advance negotiations this year will be low unless domestic political vulnerabilities alter his thinking. And of course, as the conflict continues, the human toll is only getting worse. In addition to the many tens of thousands of casualties suffered by Ukrainian and Russian militaries, 
More than 8 million people have been forced to flee Ukraine since Russia invaded. Moreover, in addition to Moscow's continued assault on Ukraine's civilian infrastructure, particularly its energy facilities and electrical grid, there is widespread reporting of atrocities committed by Russian forces. Russia and its proxy groups are using so-called filtration operations to detain and forcibly deport tens of thousands of Ukrainian civilians to Russia. The IC is engaged with other parts of the U.S. government to document and hold Russia and Russian actors accountable for their actions. Moscow has suffered military losses that will require years of rebuilding and leave it less capable of posing a conventional military threat to Europe and operating assertively in Eurasia and on the global stage. But as a result, Russia will become even more reliant on asymmetric options, such as nuclear, cyber, space capabilities, and on China. And our annual Assessment also covers Iran, North Korea, the many regional challenges we face, including in Africa, where, of course, we've seen a recent outbreak of fighting in Sudan, which is no stranger to conflict. The fighting in Sudan between the Sudanese armed forces and the rapid support forces is, we assess, likely to be protracted, as both sides believe that they can win militarily and have few incentives to come to the negotiating table. Both sides are seeking external sources of support, which, if successful, is likely to intensify the conflict and create a greater potential for spillover challenges in the region. But even so, the fighting is exacerbating already dire humanitarian conditions in Sudan, forcing relief organizations to curtail operations, raising the specter of massive refugee flows and aid needs in the region. Even before the fighting started, roughly one-third of the population, or approximately 15.8 million people, required immediate assistance because of disease outbreaks, inflation, localized conflicts, internal displacement, and weather-related food insecurity. And throughout the world, as I noted at the outset, the state actor challenges we inventory are undermining our capacity to work together with, our, with other countries to address what are utterly critical transnational threats, such as climate change, public health challenges, such as the current COVID-19 pandemic, the threat from illicit drugs, terrorism, irregular migration. 